Welcome to The Secret Truth. I'm George Butler. Well, this evening we have one of the finest guests, I mean, ever. And he's out of Bristol, England. And my gosh, he has certain, he has in-depth reporting that is just totally well, blow, mind-blowing, is what I'll say. And uh, welcome to our program, Tony Goslin. You have this drive time program now, I understand. Today, doing journalism here in Bristol. I mean, Bristol, a lot of young people, it's got the highest concentration of musicians in Britain, uh, and it's it's a pretty lively place. It was also the uh, springboard for the John Cabot voyages uh, back in the early 1500s, uh, which really was a reconnaissance mission for the colonization of North America. Now, you know, the Spanish had South America pretty much and the Caribbean and, and Britain, North America. So you can see that the North America that is today the great superpower really was something that came from a mission that set off from Bristol uh, in, you know, just after 1500 and just after Columbus actually, uh, you know, from, from Spain going, going across slightly south of John Cabot. Now, Cabot was financed by Italians, but it was Bristol merchants that were behind this mission. Uh, and that uh, reconnaissance, effectively, then led to the genocide in North America of something like 25 million Native Americans. So, you know, that, that mission and those days, are, I think it's really important to, to focus on that and, and as the main, I think, legacy of our city. Now, it's not obviously a good thing. Uh, you know, it's a bad thing that we did. And, I mean, this is awful terminology that's used you know, we discovered America. Well, hang on a minute, you know, someone had discovered it before you discovered it. Uh, And yes, there were problems with some of the activities of the Native Americans, but nothing compared to the absolute ruthless devastation caused by this group of merchants based in Bristol. And it was all very secretive as well. People were, you know, very a bit bit like oil companies are today about their prospecting and whereabouts the oil fields are. You know, no one really wanted to know, anyone else to know what they'd found out about what was going on in North America. Uh, any of your listeners sort of around New England area, I would say, whatever you do, do not miss the Mashnantucket Pequot Museum, and, and there's a Foxwoods Casino there, which basically pays for it, and that museum is absolutely fantastic, and you can go and see there the what well, they were effectively on the other end of the Bristol reconnaissance mission, uh, where where uh, uh, British merchant ships went over there to, to uh, colonise and that they played all sorts of hideous games with the Indian tribes that they came across in order to con them uh, and to slowly you know, sort of uh, take over their lands and that kind of thing. So that's a very good place to go and see that. Um, and you won't see a lot of the material on the internet because the Native Americans there who run that museum keep it pretty much in the museum itself. So you have to actually go through the doors and have a look. It's, I suppose what they're saying is, look, uh, you know, we, we, we don't advertise this, but if you take a real interest in Native American culture here, you can really come and see it. Uh, those were the Bristol merchants that, a few years after Cabot's successful voyage, formed something called the Merchant Venturers. The Merchant Venturers is uh, formed under a royal charter in the 1500s and, and it still exists to this very day. In fact, we had uh, elections here just a, a week, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, where the first ever, as far as I know, <laughs> merchant venturer mayor, uh, at least in this century or the last century, uh, was removed, and we've got someone from the Labour Party now as the mayor of, of the city, and the, the Labour Party have now uh, retaken control of the city council as well, which you know for me is a, is a good thing because they're much more interested in kind of equality and that sort of thing. But look, you know the other thing, of course, with the merchant venturers is uh, with their royal charter is that they were running the slave trade out of Bristol. They, like Liverpool, uh, were doing effectively the same triangular trade where they went down in raiding parties and had raiding stations down in, mostly in West, uh, down the coast of West Africa, Gambia, places like that, where uh, the uh, natives in in Africa were just simply rounded up at gunpoint and put onto ships uh, put in manacles, etc., and shipped over to the United States, mostly to the Caribbean. Uh, and that is, again, is you know a horrific. We had at least two million, possibly more, uh, of those uh, poor souls from Africa were 
uh, thrown overboard, killed, or just simply died on the passage in the slave ships. And again, the same pattern emerges of secrecy, because this was all kept from the Bristol public, although the money was being made by the Bristol merchants, very little news of the, what was actually going on on these uh, triangular trade ships ever got back to Bristol, because, of course, uh, they'd send guns and things like that down, and other trading goods down to Africa, and, and the, the rather nasty leg of the, of the route, which was you know where you actually had captives on board the ship, kept well away from Bristol, and then they brought things like sugar back to the city. So I think it's good, a good uh, idea to just sort of nail what is our city all about here. Um, for many years we were uh, one of the big, you know, the, the second city of, of Britain in medieval times, certainly, and there's a great natural port here. So that's where I'm doing the, the uh, current affairs radio programs, uh, I do two each week, and, and we do interview uh, members of parliament, we have local politicians on, and then, you know, in the second hour we do a two-hour show on a Friday as people are driving home, uh, and, uh, and in the second hour we kind of push the boat out, that is we do much more kind of forward-looking investigative journalism, the sort of investigative journalism that's so lacking. And I got my training at the BBC in London after working in aviation, and also in environmental campaigning, um, you know, d having done uh, a lot of, uh, I suppose, uh, more technical stuff and business stuff, I got really interested in in, uh, in investigative journalism, and I was doing work on, for example, reporting on the radio to London uh, on the IRA bombing campaign that was going on in the early 1990s before the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process, uh, and uh, and also, like I said, environmental. This is land occupations. And I suppose most of my work has really been to do with basic social justice, that is to say, this fundamental idea that we've got plenty of resources and we've got to make sure that every single person without any human being excluded has got the basic essentials, and uh, that is to say, food and water and shelter. And in fact, all this stuff is guaranteed, supposedly, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is this grand document which was signed by everybody at the end of the Second World War, and of course, slowly but surely, since then, those rights have been being eroded and we've got people like Tony Blair, uh, criminal uh, uh, politician who started an illegal war with George Bush in Iraq, which has now led to massive devastation right across the Middle East from Iraq, Syria and the creation of ISIS. This guy is still walking the streets, George. So that international law is starting to fall apart and about the only international law I right. can see that's operating is when there's a superpower backing it nowadays. You know, uh, this Bilderberg meeting yeah, is coming up, is, what, in Dresden, uh, yeah, Germany? Is, um, the dates, I think it's in the 9th to the 12th, 8th to the 12th of uh, June in Dresden. It's a biggie, this one, definitely a biggie, because um, if you look at the past meetings and how this particular location and the people who have been invited as guests fit into that, you've got some, some anomalies developing. Bilderberg is important also to look at the origins of these things. Bilderberg started in 1954, chaired by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, which uh, it's not just me that's saying he was a German spy during the Second World War. Uh, there's a, a strong implications by this uh, Dutch intelligence officer who was working with the British Army, uh, Colonel Oreste Pinto, that the people who were working with Bernhard were actually betraying a lot of the secrets to the Nazis before operations were happening, for example, Operation Market Garden. And uh, if you look at the first meeting of the Bilderberg Group and where it gets its name from, it comes from this Bilderberg Hotel where the first meeting took place in Oosterbeek in Holland. Now, Oosterbeek just happens to be the place where ten years previously a massive slaughter of British airborne forces took place. Um, and this was in a place called the Hexenkessel, which was uh, the German for the Witch's Cauldron, where British arm, uh, arm, uh, airborne troops were surrounded at Arnhem. And it's, it's become pretty clear to me that uh, this m was a, a, a very good operation by, planned by uh, Montgomery, you know, so successful in El Alamein and in North Africa, and he was a great tactician. He used to read a chapter of the Bible every night before he went to bed, Montgomery. And, uh, and basically he was betrayed. I mean, he, he had a, came up with a really good idea, which was to go round the, the West Wall, uh, round uh, into, into uh, uh, the Ruhr, and, 
uh, with, a, with an audacious plan but of course that audacious plan only works if you've got the element of surprise and there are pictures of Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands the guy that first chaired the Bilderberg meetings ten years after that former um, SS officer um, he was uh, in one of the areas of Germany which had more SS than any other part of the country he was a uh, German aristocracy a German prince, uh, and uh, and many people didn't trust him at all, you know. But uh, apparently Montgomery did, uh, and so the first Bilderberg meeting, I think, is a bit of an in joke, really. It's saying, look, this was great the way that uh, our spying managed to kill all these British troops, and many merry Americans, of course, suffered as a result because there were three airborne divisions involved in Market Garden, you know, the film, the famous film, A Bridge Too Far. Uh, with the 101st Airborne landing at Eindhoven, uh, the 82nd Airborne in and around Nijmegen, and the British 1st Airborne uh, at Arnhem and Oosterby. Uh So that whole operation, I think, is, it, like I say, it was an in-joke. They were saying, well, uh, this is the uh, great bit of spying done by Bernhard and done by the uh, Nazis that led to the deaths of many troops right at the end of the Second World War. The point being that they understood and they knew that if that operation had been successful the war would have ended by uh, Christmas 1944 it would have been such a devastating blow to cross the Rhine uh, which was where Arnhem is uh, that it would have it left the Germans with very little options uh, open to them it cut their supply lines uh, made them have to move a lot of uh, heavy uh, uh, things like armoured divisions back from the front to defend this uh, you know, rear, rear area and, um, uh, and of course what it did is it also gave uh, the Germans another uh, five months, is it five or four months up until the end of the war from Christmas to, uh, to squirrel away their wealth around the world which they were very very busy doing at the time they'd started at the Red House meeting in Strasbourg in 1944 arranging to get all of the looted billions that from Europe uh, away, mostly to Switzerland, a lot of it to Switzerland, because the Swiss have been making a lot of money out of the Second World War uh, and done a lot of deals with the Nazis, uh, and also, of course, to South America and several other places around the world. But it, it enabled the Germans, it enabled the Nazis, I think, you know, got to be clear here, this is the Nazis we're talking about, not the Germans, really. It's, uh, you know, this basically, effectively, this power cult that was going on in Germany and probably still is today elsewhere. Uh, to get all that wealth and prepare for uh, a, an economic empire after the Second World War. So that's why the Bilderberg meeting started uh, in Oosterbeek, in Holland, in that specific place at that specific time, I think, is pretty clear. And over the last few years, George, getting back to your original question, uh, they've been spiralling back in towards that right. area. Last few years we've had, well, we, have, we had uh, Watford near London, um, usually you see they go around the periphery of Europe and they go to Canada and places like this, but they haven't really been doing that much over the last few years. They've been kind of spiralling in towards uh, Denmark, uh, Germany, Austria. Are all, I mean, interestingly enough, last year's Bilderberg was in Tyrol, in Austria, which I was reading recently in Paul Manning's book, Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile, which is an absolute must-read for anybody that's interested in this uh, sort of what the end game was of the Second World War. Um, and Manning is an absolute brilliant writer, was, was a brilliant broadcaster, and of course, because he was right on the ball, history has virtually buried him. You know, he's not the sort of guy that uh, Winston Churchill and people like that would want to be writing the history. Uh, but but what he's been saying about about uh, about you know that that specific book is saying about all this is is it makes it pretty clear that there was this empire happening after the Second World War uh, and, in, and he also specifically talks about Tyrol in Austria as one of the key rat lines for the Nazis at the end of the Second World War so this co sort of ties in with the uh, Bilderberg meeting there and now we're in Dresden this year um, and we're coming back to Germany now, now the thing that shocked me most about this one George is that you've got the uh, top six politicians in Germany at the meeting. Now, this has never seen anything like this before. This is this is a major uh, uh, revelation from the left-wing parties in in the Bundestag. Uh, asked questions, and they said, "Yes, well, these guys are going to that meeting." And it's Merkel and her top five uh, ministers: foreign minister, um, we've, we've got defence minister, um, 
a whole list of them, Treasury, um, Deputy Chancellor, all the top people in the German government are going. And, of course, the part of the Bilderberg's cover story is that this is just an informal meeting between business people and a smattering of politicians. No, 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 this is not... That is not what it is. This time, certainly, is absolutely obvious. This is the most powerful people in Germany and in German policy uh, uh, presiding over a collection of people from North America and Europe. Mostly, these meetings are from the NATO countries. And it's taking place in Dresden, which is an old Eastern European country. It used to be part of Eastern Europe. Uh, and what's, uh, what fascinated me is that you've got the local, I mean the, the national left-wing parties haven't made much of a fuss about it although they've asked these questions in the Bundestag it's the local parties in Saxony that are getting annoyed about this and uh, saying well you know what do you think you're doing coming here with this uh, attitude of basically effectively a, a, you know, an international power elite landing who think they own the planet and then what they've been doing over the last uh, 60 years or so is simply privatising everything in sight, everything you can see. Everything is being privatised, genetic materials being privatised. So where, whereas we've got this wonderful planet we all live on, where there's uh, you know, an abundance of uh, natural resources, uh, the earth, the land, space to live, a free gift to, to mankind, these people think they own the place and they want to exclude everybody from it. And so that's why privatisation is so important to these people. Uh, is because they simply want to be able to buy it all up and own it all so that we can't have it and we have to come cap in hand to them. And I think that's one of the things I would tease out about the whole sort of fascist project, really, of Hitler and since the Second World War, is is this um, greed, right. really, and, and wish to possess more and more and more all the time. And there, I don't think there's, there's any real ideological um, uh, sort of... Uh, whether it's a threat or an ideological criticism of communism and, and the left and socialism and this kind of thing, it's actually just that this threatens their personal private empires and that it might be that maybe a bank, which is a, a massive, massive reserve of wealth, uh, might just be taken over by a government and might be nationalised and maybe shared out more amongst the general population. This is their real fear, George, I think. What about UK remaining a European Union? What are your <laughs> thoughts on that? Is that going to happen or what? Well, it's a sixty-four thousand dollar, I mean, four thousand euro question. I honestly can't call this one. I'm right. Looking at various of the polls, talking to friends, etc. Uh, it seems as if it's pretty well balanced, and whichever way it comes out, I don't think it's going to be a great majority one way or the other. All I can tell you is that. It, it, there is a massive amount of bamboozling going on of people through something called Project Fear here. It, that basically, the world is going to collapse around our ears if Britain leaves the European Union. That's what we're being told by the what they call the Remain campaign. Now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, much of right. my work looking into Bilderberg since I first did it back in 1995 when I first came across them, I first published the first lists of the Bilderbergers on the internet that had ever been published uh, uh, the, from the Reuters uh, secret little article sure. database I managed to get access to I put that online and, and within three or four days my service provider shut the site down because they said there was so much traffic going to it You know, that's, this is the first days of the internet really but uh, uh, right, yeah, I mean, right. that, that, uh, that list uh, that I put up there is kind of snowballed into what is a much bigger website now, www.bilderberg.org, if I can plug that. Uh, and, and much of my research into these Bilderbergers... Sure, sure. And the one of the first quotes I came across was from George McGee. I think he was the US ambassador to West Germany, as it was at the time. He's quoted as saying that the, the European community and the European Union actually were formed through the Bilderberg conferences and this is where people were brought together to get everybody on board and of course you're being schmoozed by big media uh, people like the uh, you know the Murdoch Empire uh, and and their predecessors uh, you know the Economist magazines like this uh, as well as royalty and it, what it does is it tends to get everyone on side and then what happens is if you're not on side you seem to find either that um, uh, you know, your career comes to a sticky end or you have some kind of embarrassing uh, exploit a bit, uh, uh, a bit like Dominic Strauss-Kahn had at the IMF you know, something happens and you're kind of spun out of uh, international politics 
So I think you know you're dealing with effectively a kind of cult when you're dealing with Bilderberg, and uh, and they want you know they only want their own people on side. I mean, the strong strong influence of the Rockefeller family, and of course we all know about Ida Tarbell. Most people do about Ida Tarbell um, and the breakup of Standard Oil uh, through um, you know a lot of effort and antitrust. Uh, laws in the United States, and because they've been monopolising the entire uh, the entire oil industry and vertical integration, that is buying up oil fields, refineries, uh, gas stations, and basically controlling the entire market. That is, to be able to, you know, price fixing and massive profit making. And this is, I think, where you find the link between the Nazis uh, and the people in the U.S. Not, not just Prescott Bush and the uh, the coup attempt by Prescott Bush before World War Two, and that being stopped by Smedley Butler um, you've, you've got effectively cartel systems Rockefeller and his oil cartel uh, and, and the German cartels, people like IG Farben uh, actually with a similar kind of idea, well look, all we need to do is control the government, allow massive uh, cartels to develop and we can own and control and run the entire planet, and that's what they've been doing. But look, the—I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious. Everything's been being privatised. Governments have been being denuded. Regulation has been smashed, particularly in banking, with the Bank for International Settlements uh, in Switzerland doing international regulation of banking. Well, there's been very little regulation. The banks have been able to do pretty much what they wanted, including false accounting, fraud. Uh, money laundering, etc., etc. There is no real regulation of banks, and so these guys are basically in charge. I mean, that's certainly the way I see it, and and that's their mission is to sort of run everything. Uh, it, we, one of the good things about this Brexit uh, referendum uh, debate we're having in Britain at the moment is that we're hearing much more the the term United States of Europe. We're also hearing from uh, the politician, former mayor of London, Bullingdon Club member with uh, with David Cameron and George Osborne, uh, uh, that's Boris Johnson, has been actually comparing uh, the European Union to uh, the Nazis and to Hitler and saying, well, you know, isn't it interesting that, that, that what the EU is trying to do is exactly what Hitler was trying to do and Napoleon was trying to do. What he didn't mention, George, was that all of these groupings are also very much opposed to Russia uh, and the Napoleon tried to conquer Moscow and Russia um, Hitler obviously, Barbarossa that was one of the main objectives of Hitler was to smash the Soviet Union uh, and we're seeing the same sort of thing going on today with the European Union uh, and its intervention in Ukraine supporting of far right and fascist groups effectively in Ukraine, neo nazis in fact, no, the Ukrainian neo-Nazis are not neo-Nazis, they are Nazis they have pictures of Nazis that's right, and they have yeah. They their, go their back to the old original, of don't they? Not of their yeah. Nazi heroes. I mean, you know, you can kind of understand it to a certain extent because Ukraine was, you know, a colony effectively of the Soviet bloc, and many people there see them as the big bad guys who were our colonial masters. But you know, you don't have to have quite such a backlash that you start putting jackboots and swastikas on and marching around and zekiling everywhere. You know, that that is really over the top. And but the EU is supporting this. So this is why I think it's right for Boris Johnson to point out these historical facts so that, that people like Angela Merkel cannot get away with supporting neo-Nazis or Nazis anymore. You know, they, we, we're in a really dangerous position now, in a kind of almost like a, a pre-World War II position, both financially and with, uh, with the um, r racism that's going on now, with the so-called migrant crisis which has been largely engineered through the Middle East wars and through the Mafia shipping people across, uh, across the Mediterranean. But it's a dangerous place to be, that. And, you know, uh, the EU has really proved itself to be utterly incompetent, or maybe deliberately incompetent, who knows, George. But, I mean, uh, dealing with these two major crises. One is the financial crisis, which has left uh, literally tens of millions of Southern Europeans without any prospect of work, particularly young people, uh, destitute families, evictions all over the place, uh, and so the financial system that the, that the EU has brought in, the Eurozone, has been an absolute disaster, should be booted out immediately. Because people are now are actually tied to these cash point networks that you've got right across Europe, and, and the SWIFT payment system, all this kind of thing, is a private system, it's very difficult for 
uh, people like the Greek government to do anything about it. They've simply got to go back, cap in hand, to the European Central Bank, time and time again, to the IMF, time and time again, and beg, basically. So you've got another, that's another way that European governments have been, uh, have been denuded, you know, sort of whittled away slowly. So United States of Europe is a really good thing to be here, because that's exactly what they've been trying to do, a political union. And, of course, it is, you know, different methods, but the same result, a unified Europe under one political system that, that uh, Hitler and Napoleon were trying to do. The, but, you see, the thing is, the United States of Europe would be uh, the biggest kind of conglomeration in the world. You're talking about 500 million people, a little bit more. I mean, the United States, people forget these figures sometimes, but the US has got a population of about 320 million, uh, and Russia about only 150 million, and the Chinese uh, 1.3 billion. So and India is in there too at one point, what, 2 billion or something? They are more, more, more non-aligned, and so... Right, right, right. Of, in yeah. a way, on the risk board, they're like a little player on their own. The big superpowers definitely are the United States, I mean, I'm talking about the more belligerent ones and the more, uh, you know, militarised up and the likely to get involved in a big conflict, are Europe as one, you know, sure. through, and the United States tied together through NATO, uh, and then you've got Russia and China. And, and this is uh, something I was just... As I was driving home tonight, I was just thinking this was running through my mind, George. And I don't know. I'd be really interested to see what you t your take on this is. And, and it's that it looks to me as if we've got a kind of Orwellian okay. situation which has been set up over decades, possibly even centuries, where you've got a, a European, uh, US, NATO uh, axis on the one hand, and China on the other hand. The only thing is, you've got another uh, quantity that's sitting in the middle, the Russians which they've tried for a long, long time to get the Russians integrated. They did, nearly did very well in the Yeltsin era and getting it all privatised and bought up. But this guy, Putin, came along at the right time to kick out the, the, the chief oligarchs, people like Berezovsky, who were privatising, you know, selling off the entire country. Uh, and so Russia is a kind of little ingredient that I think it's fair to say that the, the power brokers in the West had not counted on. So you've got a kind of counterbalancing influence. Russia at the moment is probably the only thing that's keeping us from some kind of like massive resource war uh, because Russia is able to deal with the Chinese and they're also very polite, amazingly enough, to the uh, Europeans and the Americans and, and kind of balancing this, these massive power blocks of Russia and NATO. So anyway, I just wonder what your take of that on all that is, George. You can't leave well, out he's Erdogan he's there in the Turkey. He's part of the you know NATO what I mean? Block, uh, Siebel Edmonds uncovered uh, corruption between the Pentagon and the Turkish military years ago. What I see going on right now is that they're building up in the northeast part of Syria for a ground invasion of Syria. And and uh, uh, that's going to come, come forth here pretty soon, it looks like. But also Erdogan is in there uh, uh, right as a player like I would not believe. And then the Saudis are in but there. Again, again, see? The Saudis are and the and then um, so the NATO has done a tremendous uh, step out operation. Uh, they've gone way, way out. And they're, they're the instead of having a U.N. army, it's the NATO that is acting like yeah. the world army yeah. you know, for these interests. So these players are coming together, and uh, Russia is being surrounded and being, uh, you could say, uh, provoked into a larger conflict of some kind, which yeah, is very no dangerous. Yeah, there's going course. on, but of course, you know, you've got a similar sort of thing on a lesser scale, certainly on the, on the news agenda. I'm not sure, you know, quite whether that's, you know, the news agenda is, I mean, it just I raise my eyebrows every day when I hear what's being reported and what's not being reported, but... In the South China Sea, it looks like there's provocations going on down there too, with the you know U.S. mainly poking Chinese. Here's the way I see it right now: with weapon systems that we have, the United States, that are being kept ultra secret, I believe that we can take down some of the uh, a threat that Russia would pose to us, or we would not be acting this aggressively towards Russia. Okay. And uh, I think the 9-11 uh, illustrates to me that we have four advanced systems uh, that we have that are very ultra-secret. Ultra see what I mean? And so well, I mean, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of that's in the background true. of all the of this, military, see? Very good it looks looking, like to me. Under wraps. But then again, yeah. you see, yeah. th there's, there's another aspect yeah. to all this. That's issue, right. Which is that, 
I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah. I mean, you look at, for example, this F-35 aircraft that's being sold. I mean, the, the, it's really not, yeah. not up to scratch. So what's going on is I think there's, there's wonderful PowerPoint presentations and, you know, air shows where these uh, projects, these various military projects are demonstrated to governments. Uh, defence ministries are very impressed, so commit vast amounts of our money to these projects. Uh, but a lot of the time they're, co they're, they're being conned. I think there was that incident with the um, USS Donald Crook a couple of years ago in the Black Sea where this, uh, I think it's a guided missile destroyer, I may be wrong about that, but it's certainly a very high-tech US um, ship, sailed into the Black, Black Sea in violation of uh, an agreement with the Russians about how many uh, NATO ships were going to be in the Black Sea at any one time. And uh, the Russians sent one of their um, fighter bomber, you know, high-speed things over with a couple of pods hung hanging under the wings with electronic warfare stuff on, and they, they did a kind of, uh, almost a kind of battle run, bombing run, fake, fake bombing run against the ship. So, you know, within a, within a, a, a few minutes, they suddenly realised the Donald Crook people, that were, hey, hang on, we could be under attack here. So they had to get ready for, uh, uh, for you know, maybe some incoming bombs and possibly to fire back at the Russian, um, Russian fighter. Anyway, they, they didn't drop any bombs on them or anything. They just pressed a little button somewhere on the Russian uh, air, uh, aircraft and it knocked out all of the uh, all of the equipment on the on the American ship everything's kind of blank blank screens you know this is electronic warfare for you and the Russians are saying basically look your ship it may have cost a fortune it may look wonderful and amazing and can do this but it it's not going to survive in a um, in a real fight and I think there's that. I mean, I'm not saying that the Americans are the only people that have been subject to this kind of thing, but I think that a lot of the uh, military technology that we've got now has been much more about lining the pockets of the private military uh, um, than about giving. Well, you, yeah, the, yeah, you're right. Well, America's in the throes. Yeah, potential to fight. Look, yeah. The, 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 before before uh, I finish that, we've also got the situation with the EU that we've had yeah. pretty much all of our heavy industry in Britain sucked out of the country. Yeah, it, it, America right now, Tony, is in the throes well, of being well, plundered so, and stolen so, blind. So you, you know, I mean, I mean, being plundered. The 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 fighter is just one thing, but it's the it's the central banking operations uh, keeping the financial institutions uh, intact or afloat. You know, but there has been a, a plundering uh, operation well, that, going on well, for the last two it, or three decades in this country. Well, what that does is, and, it's and, and, and it's breaking our country. You know, this is the thing. It's breaking if you us. don't have the big steelworks, the energy, yes, yes. Uh, coal, that sort of thing, all the various power that you need to produce things like aircraft, tanks, guns, you know, and also there are other forms of warfare, of course, aren't there, you know, whatever it is, psychological warfare, space warfare, cyber right. warfare, you know, but, but it doesn't enable the, the cyber to fire, defend yeah. itself. So if you could, if you could denude a, a nation's uh, heavy industry, basically you, you're saying, well, we, you know, we can come walking in any time we want to. Right. The, the one thing that I see the Bilderbergs have a problem with, though, is that the financial problem. They're taking, they've taken the uh, interest rates to zero, but there has been no stimulation affected of the world economy, much less America right now is in a, in a recession. Uh, our, our retail sales, everything, is, our factory orders, they're way off. They're, the government here is lying to everybody, you know, about this unemployment and all that. There's more people unemployed than ever before in the country. But so, so right now at the Bilderberg, they have a real problem uh, in the sense that they have or have been losing well, control of the financial are, sector. See. Okay. see what I mean? Here's Worldwide, a... you know. Yeah. And 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 I and they don't know what to do, see, because they still need a new a good economy well, no, to so. to function to keep their their interest. Uh, they you know. are it's so yeah. in control, so in power through the banking system, through ownership of us, you know, ownership of our workplaces, yeah. uh, ownership of our governments, uh, ownership of our industries, etc. They're such, yeah. in such a powerful place. They don't need to be seen to be doing anything successful, and effectively, they're using the economy as a, uh, a tool, if you want, a kind of 
a form of low intensity warfare against the ordinary population to get them in line you know the sorts of people who are good at corralling you know but I'm, I'm talking about the kind of boss that everybody hates that's just a bully uh, those sorts of people are doing very well today because they know that a lot of their their uh, employees are absolutely desperate to keep their jobs now this kind of suits the Bilderberger mentality when you've got a whole bunch of uh, effectively people who are incompetent but they are pliable uh, to an elite you know they're useful to an elite uh, and so the fact that the, you're absolutely right about the you know failing economy is but I think it's deliberate George I think it's a deliberate attack on, on the sorts of rights that we've been fighting for well I see your point but see in the 2008 period in there they had to run out and really shore up those financials that were conti- completely in big big trouble see and had had uh, they been in much better financial shape, they wouldn't have had to do that. So it indicated to me that they had problems well, look, worldwide, hey, and China has been a big problem to them there, too. Because I think that See? whole big business was deliberate too. That there was they yeah. knew that they'd been cooking the books, and they saw this as a yeah. great opportunity to um, to put the burden of their cooked books right onto the public purse to get public taxpayers to, to bail them out effectively was the biggest heist in history 2008 I mean well, effectively you've got a whole bunch of crooks who've been lying for years about the viability of their banking businesses and they say oh we'll hold their hands up and yeah. they say oh we're really sorry about all this but unless you but you take on this debt you the public you the politicians you the people take on this debt that we've built up we're going to collapse. They're like the suicide bombers in the room. They're, they're, they're basically threatening everybody, saying, unless you do what we say, uh, yeah. and they've been doing this with governments, obviously, for many, many years, and kings and queens, etc. They've done it to the whole population now that we are having to pay for their... I, would, I mean, I wouldn't, even, uh, I wouldn't even give them the benefit of calling them mistakes. I think the whole thing is deliberate criminality that's been bailed out by the public. And, uh, and that, to me, is just... It's just because they're greedy, they want to own everything, and they don't want to actually obey the law. So we've got a criminal elite, a, a power elite, a criminal elite, that are now effectively calling the shots. The politicians are almost nowhere to be seen in this, and if, unless they do as they're told, they don't really seem to become successful. And the only other people that can really challenge them is the mainstream media. Now, the mainstream media here in London is incredibly weak. Uh, it, it sort of scratches the surface occasionally. And sometimes, George, in the whole week, you won't see any real criticism of the, the system at all and, until you get... Uh, we have a weekly program called Question Time on the BBC uh, where maybe a member of the audience makes a point, you know, which is actually to the point. And you get a big round of applause, but the rest of the real debate is kept off of the mainstream media and is kept to a very, very narrow, uh, very, very narrow area. Most of the main people from the BBC, from the main program, uh, which is the nightly new BBC News, have been bullied out, forced to leave, etc. Michael Crick, brilliant investigative journalist, we're right in the middle of this amazing scandal, George, here, which is the Conservative election fraud. If you, if you go on to Twitter, for example, you'll find there's a hashtag, Tory election fraud, and uh, it could be that many of David Cameron's MPs, certainly enough to lose him, uh, the majority in Parliament are going to be prosecuted on criminal offences by the police here in Britain for uh, overspending and defrauding their election expenses. So I don't know if you come across that story, but the BBC and some of the main political journalists in London have been trying to keep the lid on that one. It's now uh, coming out that uh, I think it's something like 12 police forces in the country are now investigating uh, in, uh, fraudulent uh, expenses in the election. So. You know that that this is this is uh, potentially is a bit like the um, hacking scandal with Rupert Murdoch. It's going to run and run that one, um, and very very bad for, for 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 the Tories. Very bad, particularly for Cameron. The other thing I'll tell you is I've heard a few rumours from people in the know, George, that Cameron may step down, whatever the result of the Brexit uh, referendum is, in June, literally the day after the referendum, and. And someone else then take over the leadership of the Conservative Party and be Prime Minister. Uh, that I've heard from several sources, so I think it's pretty credible rumour. Let's get back to, to Dresden, OK? Um, Dresden was one of the worst uh, attacks. I think it was the single worst attack well, during World well, War II. Is that what you have on uh, that, on a, Dresden? A, a horrific 
Um, and it's one of the one of the it, you know people point to it as a potentially uh, Bomber as Harris's a, big war crime. They reckon around about twenty five thousand people, mostly civilians, died in Dresden in a massive fire fire bombing of one night. You know, and uh, there was some there was some strategic reasons for yeah. it, which was that it was a. a um, a, being used for supplies for the for the German army for both the Eastern Front and the Western Front and uh, through, from rail and it was a kind of railway hub but you know there, there is I think it's fair to say you know this is wartime for goodness sake that it was you know it was it was part of the I suppose shock and awe of trying to kill civilians and possibly was a war crime you know but but uh, and that may but well be why the Germans have uh, decided to hold it there, you know, uh, because of that sort of, you know, that where we've got this is this is where we, you know, so many Germans were actually the victims, uh, many Germans who weren't Nazis were the victims in the Second World War, and actually they've got a point there. Well, we started bombing uh, residential areas I know in Berlin uh, towards the end of World War Two. So uh, it wasn't it was to demoralise yeah, the German be, population. It, also, it was partly. Uh, kind of so quid, they're, they're quid pro quo for the uh, v- well, well, I'm thinking particularly more about for the, the bombing of England, yeah, in London, uh, yeah. These also were, you know, yeah, about morale yeah. largely, and you know, destroying people's morale, and that is a large part of warfare. Actually, it's a large part of business yeah. too. If you've got a business with a high morale, good morale, and esprit de corps, like uh, Montgomery, the Desert Fox had in uh, the Eighth Army. Uh, winning the Battle of El Alamein before the Americans had come into the war, by the way. Um, that was, uh, and, and church bells rang out all across England in World War II uh, after El Alamein, uh, where you've got a really good esprit de corps, where you bring the cooks from the mess room in for the briefing as well as everybody else, and you don't start the briefing until the cooks are in the mess room. Everyone really does feel part of the same, they're all on the same team. Uh, and and when you can do that in a business or in an army right. or in a country, you're going to be successful. Whatever's going to happen. But that the opposite of that, of course, is happening now. We've got a kind of divide policy. We've got a horrible gap uh, chasm um, opening up between rich and poor, which really destroys morale in society. When you can see, you know, who is going to help these people. Even people who are fairly wealthy are looking around, thinking, "My God, what kind of society am I living in?" You know. So this is this is, I think. You know that that effectively is uh, part of Bilderberg's mission is to put the whole of society on the back foot, effectively, and uh, and and increase divisions so that it's very difficult for people to um, have you know to fulfil their potential, I suppose. Uh, and there, then we're in the situation where it's much much easier to divide communities, for example, along racial lines. Uh, and that's what what seems to happen when you get economic depressions like we've got here in Britain. You've got hideous um, uh, people with absolutely no food at all, you know, queuing up, being evicted from their homes, this kind of thing. Then uh, it's very, very easy to get poor communities and divide them down racial lines or other lines and get them fighting each other. This is the elite. What the elite love more than anything else is watching poor people fighting each other. The sarin gas... Uh, uh uh, rumors here lately are they beginning to point those towards another Assad attack uh, using sarin gas of course they they lied about the first one but have you heard that seemed to be uh, I think the Israelis are putting out information about uh, Assad and the uh, Syrian government having well, sarin I mean, gas I, I, have you I, heard this is, this is the, the, Iraq, the Israeli that's something just brand uh, new that's brand new stuff um, viruses yeah you know biological weapons which are racist biological weapons. Right. You know, I don't think the Israelis are in any position to point the finger at anybody. They, they haven't signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They've got something like 200 nuclear weapons that they are undeclared and they completely refuse to admit that they've got. You know, uh, it looks like the Israeli Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, was involved uh, in both the September 11th attacks and the 7-7 London bombing. So who the hell is Netanyahu and the Israelis to point the finger at anybody uh, of course, they love pointing the finger because then it makes it look as if uh, maybe they aren't the people who are guilty. I mean, I did a lot of work on Israeli involvement in the 7-7 attacks in London, uh, and certainly there's at least a couple of very strong indications that they were involved. This company, Verint Systems, um, which had just got a contract which gave them access to the tube tunnels just a few months before the bomb attacks, 
uh, run by uh, an expert in explosives from the Israeli army and um, and also uh, the Benjamin Netanyahu on the day and the Israeli press office getting a warning of some sort at 7am on the morning of a surprise attack you know this is uh, I, I actually oh was my, told by oh my gosh the Herald, God. Um, yeah uh, who'd spoken to the press office that morning whose name was Dan Shaham S-H-E-H-A-M he was the Israeli press spokesperson uh, and my colleague at the Scottish Sunday Herald in Glasgow was told by him at 7am well we've had a warning and we were on a lockdown uh, a high security alert from 7am for a surprise attack come on where did you find out about that from uh, and so you didn't tell the rest of London you didn't tell anybody else but you somehow knew that there was about to be a bomb attack in London a surprise bomb attack you know I'm afraid this sort of stuff doesn't wash and I, and I don't really listen much to uh, the Israeli finger pointing certainly from the government obviously there's quite a lot of very good Israeli citizens out there uh, but the government and the security services there are absolutely some of the most appalling people on the planet and it's an apartheid they're running a, running a racist state. Right, it looks like Gladio uh, is being used uh, all over. Moving yeah. to the Holy Land, um, yeah. actually mostly European Jews, not uh, Semitic Jews, not from that part of the world, yeah. and tell everyone how to behave. They've got a damn cheat. This uh, Gladio thing is being taken well, all over the place, place, isn't it? Yeah, the, you know what I mean? That te those yeah. techniques. I mean, you've got, yeah. uh, you've got um, a whole history there from... Uh, really from the end of the Second World War. Effectively, you're going into uh, psychopathic psychology. Well, exactly, so exactly. Now, that's strong in well, these what groups, you do isn't is it? You, you kind of stab your own arm until huh? it bleeds, and he's screaming, running around the room, saying, he stabbed me, he stabbed me. Right. Now, that's effectively what you're doing with the um, uh, the false flag attacks, with the nine things like that. I, I mean, I don't know if you've come across the article. Right. It's on a very good website, which uh, is, you know, because we all know how dreadful Wikipedia is, it's massively infiltrated, there's no uh, proper appeal system <laughs> if you see your your facts being uh, mangled by something. Right. There is no appeal system that is in any way effective on Wikipedia, but Wikispooks is a different story. If you go onto Wikispooks, you'll find all sorts of good stuff, including this article, 9-11 uh, Israel did it, all the proof in the world. Now, I'm not saying that that article is 100% factual, but it does raise some of the most important issues about the September 11th attacks in one article. And in fact, um, you know, there's, I, I, I think you, you have to go a long way, maybe through the work of people like Christopher Bolin uh, and others to, to really identify the, the nuts and bolts of what really happened on September the 11th. But certainly the Israelis, and particularly... Uh, dual Israeli US citizens it seems are absolutely key involved in, in perpetrating the attack, not just in sitting back and watching them happen but actually in, in actively involved in and profiting from the September the 11th attacks which was, you know, this, that's effectively the, the forefront of most you know, people who are really looking into this is knowledge Chris Bolin I would actually also say I met him for the first time back in 2000 um, at the Bilderberg conference in uh, in Jeanval in Br in just outside Brussels, uh, which was uh, yeah I mean uh, we had a fantastic time down there. There was only a handful of us uh, protesting uh, outside. I suppose protesting. I was reporting on it too, writing about the conference. You know, talking to staff from the hotel, trying to talk to some of the guests, talking to the local uh, Belgian TV people about it. We got a load of TV cameras down on the Sunday, which was fantastic a lot of coverage on the TV and in the newspapers um, and uh, that was where I first met Chris you know so uh, I've got a lot of time for him and I, American Free Press has gone down a very dark route in the last few years since the death of Jim Tucker and his brilliant work on Bilderberg there they really have gone I think I don't know what you're, you're, you make of it George down a much more you know genuinely anti-Semitic anti-Jewish uh, where they're you know they're they're, they're yeah, I think I think that they've become a racist, you know, m magazine, and I, you know, I, I imagine I'll be meeting some of the reporters there in Dresden. But you know, I, I will certainly give them a piece of my mind about some of the coverage that they've been giving of the global situation at American Free Press since Jim Tucker died. Yeah, you know who's agreed recently with Boris Johnson's view of, uh, of what's going on uh, uh, about uh, you know the German connection there. 
uh, oh, yes, was sorry, Adam uh, Lavor. Are Lavor. you familiar with him? Yeah. Right. He recently wrote an article in Mail Online, Adam Labor did. And he backed up what Boris Johnson was saying about the might and the dominance of the well, German uh, okay. business machine, so to speak. Cook, See what I mean? Steel company in Europe. Uh, I don't know what other parts of the world they're in, but they are massive. Now, we've got a big steel yeah. works in South Wales um, because that's where there was a load of coal historically, um, which is one of the biggest steel works in the country and under threat of closure at the moment. Uh, uh, Tees and Crook could buy it up just with, at a drop of a hat and could keep those jobs but they won't because they want to see what's going to happen with the Brexit vote you see this is the sort of thing that's going on here if Britain votes out then Tees and Crook obviously aren't interested in the plant if it votes to stay in then they might use this as a sop to say well yeah I mean if you vote to stay in we will keep your plant open this is what happens when you lose control of your country which is what the British government's done ever since uh, 1973 when we first joined the European Economic Community and started to have to implement all these directives uh, you know so that that effectively is you know the, the company that Thyssen Krupp it was two companies originally Thyssen and Krupp's Thyssen um, funded the Nazi party Paul Manning says in his brilliant book and I point people back to this again and again Martin Borman Nazi in exile he explains in there Thyssen's method for uh, currying favour with the Nazis in their early days uh, which was promising them uh, party funds however many, something like 20 Deutschmarks or something, for every tonne of steel they sold, so there was a symbiotic relationship between uh, Thyssen and the Nazi party and, and all, with all this money flowing in including from the United States uh, the, the Nazi party almost couldn't fail in a country which was failing economically uh, and then Krupp's, uh, their steel uh, empire, uh, they were one of the people who were building the Tiger tanks for the Second World War. So these are the people who are dominant in steel in Europe right now. And in fact, talking to My World gosh. War II veterans about My this, I was gosh. talking to a guy, I tell you. Barry Wynn, the other day, W-Y-N-N-E, uh, I mean, he was, uh, his father worked for the 8th Army uh, under Montgomery doing supplies for the 8th Army, which was a hell of a job, George. They would have to get ships across the North Atlantic, yeah. down the coast yeah. of North America, then through the Caribbean, through, down through South America, then round the Horn of Africa and up and into <laughs> Egypt that way, you know, round the, <laughs> right the way, uh, in order to... Golly, uh, man! And, and boot him out of uh, North Africa, which was a hell of a task. But his, that was his, uh, his father, Barry's father's job in, in the war. And uh, Barry then went on, he was in the SAS in Burma and places like that uh, after the Second World War. And then he became one of the uh, first um, executives in independent television here in Britain, where we were, they were making programs like uh, the Avengers, Armchair Theatre, they were doing some really, well, the Avengers is pretty famous all around the world, and they were making those shows back in the 1960s and early 70s, um, and, and Barry is just, you know, talking to him about some of this stuff is, is you know, he, you, can, you can see that there are, uh, he's, when, I, when I talk to, started talking to him about Thiessen and Crooks, you could see his, actually a shiver go up his spine. Tony, uh, why don't you uh, give us a conclusion of some of your thoughts? We've got about two minutes left, and give us some uh, websites to come into. I'll have them up on. I have them up on well, the web I mean, already I this evening. I but go ahead and, and, and reiterate a little bit. Take place without talking about Freemasonry, uh, because certainly there's some very key uh, people who are on the periphery of it and in, and in the, in the middle of it who has been proven that were Freemasons. Now, you know, that might not necessarily itself mean much, but uh, 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 certainly Joseph Rettinger, a Polish guy who was the main person that started the first Bilderberg Conference, he was a Mason. Also Andrew Palmer, who was the uh, uh, personal assistant to the Duke of Kent. He actually organised the Bilderberg Conference at Turnberry in Scotland, one of the last ones to happen here in Britain, and that ma managed to leak out. So he's he is the personal assistant to Britain's chief Freemason, the Grand Wizard, Grand Master of uh, the United Grand Lodge, and he's organising the Bilderberg Conference. So don't tell me Freemasonry's got nothing to do with this. I mean, I've got n not a lot against m most most Freemasons, but what happens is 
over generations sometimes and other times it's just because you get someone with criminal intent who becomes a Freemason you end up with more and more criminality towards the top of the organisation it's effectively a religious cult George a dangerous religious cult uh, and yes Hitler did persecute the Masons but there's quite a lot of evidence that that was only the, because there were some decent Freemasons that he wanted to get rid of so this whole idea of Freemasonry swearing oaths to your own little tiny elite criminal group rather than to the rest of us is a key key thing right now and in, and probably into the future and we really need to get to understand this if we we want to put the world back on the right track again because we cannot allow these criminals to be, be in power i mean you know we're, we're in a situation now with a criminal elite i said earlier but if you go to look at roberto saviano's book He's, uh, he was involved in drug dealing in South America and Mexico and the US and, uh, and Colombia, cocaine basically. And uh, he, what he says is that, that big business nowadays, that is to say in the financial sector, all the big companies doing tax avoidance, that kind of thing, they're modelling themselves on the narco cartels. And the narco cartels are a successful model, they're doing exactly the same. They're working with these big banks like HSBC. The rest of us are we're obeying the law yeah but but these are the guys that are thriving so we're in a very right, right. situation uh and uh, i think possibly the only thing between us and some kind of armageddon situation at the moment is the strength that the russians are showing in propping up syria syria is a really key place we must make sure that that doesn't fall uh because if it does to the israelis and to nato and to the west uh, that will be a green light for even more regime change. Thank you for being with us, Tony Gosling. Appreciate it.